All together beautiful, all together lovely. Hear the sound, the song of heaven. Holy, 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 breaking in, breaking in. step into the fullness of all that you've provided, all that you've called us to be and to do. Father, we step into you. It's not by might nor by power, but by your spirit, says the Lord. Father, we put on your spirit. We in, in, invite you to come into this room, into this city, into this nation. Jesus, we gladly bow our knee in subjection to you. Father, we ask that you invade, the songs of heaven would invade this nation. 
that it would shift the atmosphere, that your glorious light, the radiance of your face, Jesus, would shine upon every dark area and drive it far from the shores of this land. Remove the things that don't belong here. Remove the people that do not belong here. And Father, let the light of your glorious face shine upon the ones you have set in their place, set upon seats of government, set upon uh, as judges in their seats in the courts. Father, we ask for righteousness, truth, and justice to prevail in this land. Let it prevail in our hearts. Let it prevail in our churches. We give honor and glory to the only one who is worthy to receive it. King Jesus, King Jesus, you are worthy. You alone are worthy. for lingering there with us for a while because I believe that after breakthrough and worship you know that we it's it's really good for us to just linger and and uh, minister to the Lord amen thank you I mean there was times tonight when I feel like there was a thousand people in the room I think the angels joined us so father we thank you for breakthrough on every side we thank you that that we, when we worship you in heaven, Father, that heaven invades this space, that it takes over our atmosphere, it changes our minds, it changes who we are, and you allow us to come up higher. You invite us to come up to the realm where you are and declare and to see a thing, listen and see a thing, hear a thing, and then bring it to the earth and declare it. Father, let your spirit invade this nation. Let your spirit invade this place. Give us breakthrough on every side. And we worship and we honor you tonight in Jesus' name. Amen. Again, thank you for joining with us tonight. Let's give the guys in the sound booth a big hand. Tyrese is doing an amazing job back there. If we could just bring down the house music. As they're doing that, I would just want to announce quickly that we're... Um, going to receive in tithes and offerings. Uh, that wasn't my announcement, but that's what we are. We're going to continue to uh, worship and with our tithes and offerings. And if you would uh, need a credit card slip, please raise your hand. Uh, an usher, if we can get the ushers to quickly give those out. Credit card slips. There's an envelope uh, on your seat. Most likely, if you need one, an envelope, please raise your hand. If you'd like to give... Um, uh, online, you can go to our website at glorifierchurch.com and click on the donation button. Um, we are still collecting uh, uh, anyone that wants to sew into the moving expenses for the church. You know, we've we've moved in the last month, and it's it's really grown to about five or six thousand dollars now because we had to upgrade some old computer in the back that just could not keep up with the technology. So, But money has come in already. There's been uh, around 2,500 that came in. So we still need about another 2,500. That would be really good. So um, I'm going to always announce it online too because there's people that, can, that are out there that support us and they send money. And uh, so let's just keep believing for that. We're gonna, we still want to upgrade our, our camera system a little bit. We want to add one more and 
and uh, just to make everything um, as, as good as what we can, right? Amen? We're so glad that um, we have technicians available that can run sound and broadcast, and it's a whole new expense for the church, so that has been added to the budget as well. And uh, But we're, yes, we... Um, we just uh, welcome all of our visitors. Anyone here for the first time tonight? Well, yeah, good. Good to have you. What's your name? Alex? Nice to have you, Alex. Some of our people had uh, major things happen in their homes, and um, it wasn't breakthrough. It was a breakdown of pipes and water lines that... Are f- and, uh, you know, flooded some areas. So some people are in here tonight and we miss them. Um, so let's pray over the offering. Father, we just thank you that you give us the ability to sow into your kingdom, to sow into what you're doing in Lake Mary, in Glory Fire, all across the East Coast and, and even in Florida and this nation. Father, let us be like a beacon on the, on a, like a city on a hill. Uh, from this place that you've given us, Father, that that you've given us so graciously, calls us to be a lighthouse to this whole region. And Father, uh, even let us declare the word of the Lord that goes out and changes atmospheres for your glory and your name's sake. Amen. And, And bless every gift, every giver, multiply it back to every household, multiply it back to every checking account, and Father, would you continue to raise us up to to heal every person, body, soul, and spirit in this uh, in this fellowship and extended family? Father, would you even save the loved ones that yet haven't come into your kingdom? Father, you said if one person be saved, him and his whole house will be saved. So we're believing for whole houses to be saved in a day. And Father, we just give you honor and glory and blessing because you alone are worthy in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you again so much for, for being here, for sowing in the glory of our year. You can bring it forward, put it in the uh, treasury boxes. And um, I just quickly will make an announcement that uh, what in two weeks, I believe it's two weeks, uh, Barbie Brethet will be here. Dr. Barbie Brethet, she's been a longtime friend of ours. Um, she will be ministering in the supernatural realm. I'm not sure what it will be, but uh, you never know. But it's always good. Amen. We worked together for John Paul Jackson many years ago, and uh, uh, we became great friends. And so we invite you to be here, especially for that. Um, Thanksgiving's coming up. We're going to clarify, you know, the the holidays this year are falling on like some on Friday night. So we're not sure exactly what we're going to do and what we can arrange with the other church. Uh, As soon as we know, we might back it up to a Thursday night. Would everybody like that? So you can be free like on New Year's Eve or something. Um, we'll, We'll see. We'll make the announcement and let you know. Okay. Tonight, I really want to uh, focus on the knowledge of the glory of the Lord. You know, the scripture uh, or, or, or scripture tells us that the knowledge of the Lord, of the glory, knowledge of the glory of the Lord will cover the earth like the waters cover the sea. And often we, we can quote it, we know it, but um, often we, we don't always know what all that in, entails. I'm going to speak to that a little bit, but just as an introduction tonight, I wanted to just keep on um, pressing through on this whole election thing, but I'm not going to dwell there. But as believers, we need to stay strong, right? We need to stand, stay strong, pray and fast. I know I heard one minister say that there's no reason to fast and pray anymore because it's like we're in the New Testament and and I'm thinking like, well, no, if you don't have any kind of f- prayer, I mean, uh, any kind of fasting and you don't do any warfare, then probably you're not being that effective in where you're at. And um, but uh, the, the disciples and even the apostles wrote it. Paul certainly prayed and fasted. And um, so I think it's an important thing in our, in our 
um, in our Christian life, if we want to grow, if we want, because whenever we fast, you know, it, it's not to get God's attention. It's to clarify our own spirit. Let that spirit come forth and, and let the flesh be subject to it. So it becomes a little clearer and we hear more clearly. We see more clearly. So that's what that is. And we are all aware that there's currently a legal battle going on, both in the heavens and earth. I believe there's a mighty battle in the heavens right now, as well as the earth. It manifests in our, in our vision, in our, um, in our sight, in the earth. But corruption is and always will be uh, uncovered. It's a matter of time. But we're, uh, they're doing it in a legal way. But the things of darkness will always be exposed under God's glorious light. God is light. He is the way, the truth, and the light. There's never a contest between darkness and light. Light automatically wins every time. Like I always think of that when I walk into this room. It's completely dark. But when I walk in, we don't have switches. They're automatic. There's sensors that come on and the light comes on. And you know what? The darkness never hangs around. It always flees. So all you have to do is just bring the light in and darkness flees. It's never a contest. Amen. It's the way that the Lord set it up uh, upon the the, uh, foundation of the earth. And um, the truth will always be exposed darkness because truth is a person. His name is Jesus Christ and he is the light. I believe God and Jesus... Uh, think so much more about our situation even than than what we do. We we get concerned, but he has it in the palm of his hand. He knows the beginning and the end. There's a scripture in Proverbs 14, verse 19, which says, the evil will bow down before the good and the wicked will bow down at the gates of the righteous. I love that because that's a promise to us. Here, gates could be translated as authority, right? So it's like, and the wicked will bow down at the gates of our authority. That's your, you are a gate of, in the earth for heaven to uh, come through. And so the wicked will bow under the authority and to the authority of the righteous. That's why, you know, we often say this is the decade of pay, right? If you, if you follow the Hebrew and uh, this, it's not only the year of pay, but it's a decade of pay. Uh, meaning the twenties is a uh, pay, which which is a symbol in the symbolic uh, or the metaphoric symbolic symbols of the Hebrew. It means the mouth. So what what does that mean? It's a decade that we have to speak, declare, breathe over the like. That's why it's so important that we know what the Father's doing, and we open our mouth as a community of believers and release it in the land. That is scripture. That's our promise that the, the wicked will bow under the authority of the righteous. So we can no longer be a silent majority. This is the decade of pay. It is our time and our season to use our mouth to breathe, breathe and prophesy and declare the word of the Lord over this nation, to speak the word over of the Lord over our government. There is still a fight going on, and and I believe that Donald Trump has taken a lot of punches in the last four years. But he, he, we know that he knows how to get back up, doesn't he? He swings hard with knockout punches. But I believe the Lord has, yeah, I mean, we all, we all love him, man, you know, but, but I believe that the Lord has put him here for a reason. It's much bigger than just for the sake of running a nation. It's it's much bigger reason uh, with greater implications than we can imagine. Second Corinthians ten verses three to five gives us a picture into that. For though we walk in the flesh, we are not waging war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not the flesh, but have divine power to des- destroy strongholds. We destroy arguments and every lofty opinion that raises itself against the knowledge of God and take every thought captive to obey Christ. So please keep praying with us that God strengthens this man. Pray that wisdom comes upon the president and those around him to fight back against the assault of the enemy. I know as believers we are 
in this world, but we're not of this world or its kingdoms. We live above it. In essence, we play by another set of rules. That's a, a privilege of being in the kingdom. You get to operate at a higher level. We get to operate in a, and play by a different set of rules, right? Because we're righteous. We are, we've been bought by the blood of Jesus. Therefore, we, we've been invested in, we've, we, we belong to him. We're of a higher order. He gives a strategy how to defeat our enemies in the most unusual ways, doesn't he? Many times in scripture, he has uh, used the most unusual ways to defeat the enemies of God. Often we think of, of um, it was just on my mind. <laughs> the spies, okay, the 300 spies. Who was the leader? Where God took it down from 300,000 to 30,000. Gideon. I'm really testing you guys. I was just was waiting for you. So, you know, Gideon started with 30,000. He was play, uh, actually, he was placing his trust, right, in his numbers of people. Not intentionally, but he was working with what he had. And God says, well, that's, that's too many. It's too many. I want to show you a miracle. So he got it down to 30,000. Then he says, well, you still have way too many. You, you got to get it down. So uh, eventually it was down to 300. And uh, those were the ones who, um, you know, drank from their hands while watching at the same time. It's a wonderful story. And I believe that it doesn't take many to save a nation. That's the point. It takes the spirit of God. It takes the power of God in a people in agreement to save a nation. Habakkuk 2 says it plainly. I will take my stand. This is our call. Tonight I want to touch on a few things, but this is a, a, a call. Um, if you get cold, uh, you have to have Pastor Ron has set, set the temperature up on my phone. <laughs> so I'm sorry, but I'm really enjoying it up here. It's nice and cold. Um, I won't be changing it anytime soon, but sorry if you're cold. But uh, Habakkuk 2 says it plainly. I will take my stand at my watch post and station myself on the tower and look out to see what he may say and what I will answer concerning my complaint. And the Lord answered me, write the vision, make it plain on tablets so he may run who reads it. In other words, when, when you get your answer, you're actually going to run with the answer. For still, the vision awaits its appointed time it hastens to the end. It will not lie. If it seems slow, wait for it. Surely it will come. It will not delay. I feel like we all are in this delay right now. We're all like saying, when God, when? But he says, take your position upon the wall, you know, and, and ask of the Lord what he wants to say and listen to it. And then write the vision down so others may run with it. Okay, if it seems slow, it says, wait for it, it'll surely come. It will not delay. Behold, and then it shifts. Behold, his soul is puffed up. It is not upright within him, but the righteous shall live by his faith. Verse 5, an arrogant man is never at rest. He is, his greed it is, is as wide as Sheol. Like death, he never has enough. He gathers for himself all nations and collects all of his own peoples. I see that happening Right on the news channels, right? Woe to him who heaps up what is not his own. For how long? Question mark. And loads himself with pledges. Will not your debtors suddenly rise? Those who awake will make you tremble. Then you will be spoiled for them because you have plundered many nations. All of the remnants of the people shall plunder you. For the blood of man and violence to the earth, to cities and all who dwell in them. Woe to him who gets evil gain for his house, to set his nest on high. I believe we're witnessing this as clear as day when I was reading this. To be safe from the reach of harm. You have devised shame for your house by cutting off many peoples. You have forfeited your life. For the earth, then it ends with this. This is, seems like it's thrown in there. And you think, 
but it's a wonderful promise. It says, For the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters covers the sea. That's the answer we're waiting for. That's what we're watching and waiting for. So there's two phrases I want to concentrate on tonight. The gospel of the kingdom will be preached to all nations, and then the earth shall be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord. Those two, those two statements, those two phrases. Jesus connected the timing of his return to the preaching of the gospel of the kingdom to all nations. We have the technology today to reach the whole earth. There's no one without a uh, possibility of some kind of uh, information or receiving information. We, we read that in uh, Matthew 24, 14, is that Jesus connected his, the timing of his return to the preaching and the gospel of the nation to all nations. God's answer to the escalating lawlessness, because I know we're all interested in that, is the message. It's the message of the gospel of the kingdom. That's the answer. It's not to fight back, but it's to give them the gospel of the kingdom, the message of that. The Holy Spirit will emphasize and anoint this message as we give it. And, and he also, the Holy Spirit is going to mobilize people to do it and will fund it for his glory. We saw that happening with Sean Fouette recently, right? He, he just suddenly became a worship movement that went from state to state. It all got funded. You know, God put his spirit on it, his anointing on it. I believe he broke, uh, he had breakthrough in many cities, many uh, strategic locations. Matthew 24, 9. Then when you, uh, will you be hated by all nations for my name's sake? Wait a minute, it gets better. Don't, don't get tripped up with that. We're already hated. And then many will be offended, will betray and hate one another. Lawlessness will abound, it says in verse 12. The love of many will grow cold. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the water, uh, all the world as a witness to the nations or, or um, tribes. And then the end will come. So we know the end isn't here yet. It's only the, the signs of the times. I almost started out on the signs of the times, and, but um, I just went a different direction because I felt like the Lord was directing it there. And Jesus' primary ministry mandate given to all of the believers is to proclaim the gospel of the kingdom to the nations. The gospel is the good news about a king and his kingdom community. The gospel is first good news about the glory and the, the beauty and the person of Jesus, his kingdom and his purposes. The beauty of Jesus as, as the branch or the Messiah, as in Isaiah, it will be magnified, it says. Scripture says this, the beauty of King Jesus will be magnified when he returns. In Isaiah 2, I'm going to read that verse for you. It said, in that day, in other words, the end of times, don't let that bother you, but it's the end of time, right? Because we live in time, but we're not of it. We live outside because God lives outside of time. So in that day, the end of times, the branch of the Lord or the Messiah shall be beautiful and glorious. That's a promise in Isaiah 2 verse 4. The kingdom is a central theme of Jesus' teaching. One theologian defined the kingdom um, as God's redemptive reign in Christ, destroying his enemies and bringing to his people the blessing of his reign. We just got finished singing about being seated in heavenly places. That's why we sing about this, because this reality and this truth is becoming more and more evident as people press in. We get away from religion and we start pressing into the kingdom, and uh, people are, are becoming more aware of that's where we need to be. Matthew 4, verse 23, And Jesus went about all Galilee, preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing all kinds of sickness and all kinds of disease. So that's included in the message of the kingdom. It's healing. One of our main mandates as kingdom people is to re release healing everywhere we go. 
physical, spiritual, and, and like a heart, body, and soul. All of it has to be healed. The kingdom impacts every sphere of our society. That's his plan. That's his desire. That his kingdom invades all spheres, every specter or of society. In Genesis 1, verses 26 through 28, the Lord called us to bring every sphere of society under dominion. That was our initial responsibility in, Gen- in Genesis. Later, he commissioned us uh, in the New Testament to disciple nations by bringing them into agreement with Jesus. That's in, found in Matthew 28. So let me read Genesis 1, verse 20. God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth and subdue it, having dominion over the fish of the sea and over every living thing that moves upon the earth. That was just a a fraction of what he said there. But the church, the uh, ecclesia, or the ecclesia, is God's light and salt today in the earth to impact society in this age. Right? It, it, we read that in Matthew 5. It says, you are the salt of the earth. You are the light of the world. That's Matthew 5, 13 and 14. The ecclesia is the Greek word translated in the New Testament as church. And it comes from the little phrase ek, meaning out from and to. It means to be taken out of something. You're, you're always taken out of something before you're moved into something else. Right And kaleo meaning to call. So you're called out of and called into the ecclesia. It has to do with a group of people called out of, from one place and to another. It's a group, assembly, or a congregation. It's, it's what Jesus founded upon the earth. The manifestation of his kingdom is released through the ecclesia. So the ecclesia in the New Testament is a group of people who have been called out of the world and into God, but sadly only part of the church is walking in the de- demonstrative power of the kingdom, right? There's only, not everyone's moving in that same, um, the healing power, releasing the kingdom. Others can become very complacent. But I believe God has brought us to this confrontation that we're experiencing um, this month, you know, between good and evil going on right now in this nation because he wants to give us the victory, amen? God will always set us up to give us a promotion. If he wants to give you, he goes, ah, I see my son down there, James. And, you know, he's, he's ready for his promotion. I really want to give him some. But to be justified, God has to... Give him a little something to overcome. So he lets you go through a test and he's with you so you can make it. You go through the test, you pass the test, and then he he gives you your promotion. It's really a wonderful setup. You know, it's really like, it's like you can't lose, you know, because God's with you. You know, so we're not going to lose this thing. But but if we fight, we win. But if we become complacent, We lose all of our God-given rights. That's how significant this decade has become. That's why it's so significant that we open our mouth, that we we prophesy, decree, and declare uh, the word of the Lord over this nation. I believe that this is a preset uh, moment on God's timeline, a timeline in the history of the world that he will give us the battle and he will give us the win if we, are, if we stay true to our calling and purpose. I believe really that God is preparing a spiritual tsunami, if you will, to sweep the nations and reclaim our culture for Christ. Not just our nations, but his, his desire is actually for nations, all the nations. I, Haggai um, 2 verse 7 says, I will shake the nations and the desire of the nations shall come. This very fascinating verse apparently has double meaning. It applies first to the rebuilding of the temple by Zerubbabel in the Old Testament. In that sense, uh, you know, the children of Israel were in Babylon and and, in captivity. But um, God put it upon this king to rebuild the walls. But um, 
Zerubbabel was part of that. And in a sense, God promises that the wealth of the nations will flow into his temple in Jerusalem. The rest of the verse promises that God will fill the rebuilt temple with his glory. I want to see the glory of God released. Like, I know there was glory here tonight. There was a release of something in the atmosphere. We shifted something. We moved something. Come on. You guys did it. Along with the angels. I believe the angels joined us tonight because I could feel there's something more than just uh, a, a few of us gathered together. There's a higher power. See, Christians have traditionally seen in this verse a foreshadowing of the coming of Christ because Jesus in John 2, verses 20 and 21, referred to his body as this temple, right? Meaning this temple. He told us that he pointed at the old temple and he said, not one stone will be left upon another. It was all going to be destroyed. But he, Because he was doing something new. He was rebuilding a, a new temple with living stones, right? Uh, Jesus is the ultimate desire of all nations. And the radiance of God's glory is what the, what the temple pictured. It was a picture of Christ fulfilled. His glorious temple now is displayed through all of your faces. All of the believers all over the earth. It's, it's a mu- multiplied temple in a much different um, situation. It's, it's the nations now. It's not just one central location. But that's not all. When the writer of Hebrews contemplated the coming end of the age, he quoted Haggai 2, verse 6, and applied it to the coming of Christ. Listen, Hebrews 12, we believe it was Paul that wrote Hebrews. It says, at that time, his voice shook the earth, but now he has promised, once more will I not only shake the earth, but also the heavens. The words once more indicate that the removing of what can be shaken that is created things so that what cannot be shaken may remain. Now we know that whatever can't be shaken is eternal. That's what it's talking about. The temporal things will fall away, but whatever is eternal is going to remain. That's what Jesus is really interested in, the eternal things. That's why everything that we do uh, that is, has no eternal value really doesn't count. It's not going to remain. That's what God is doing in our day. He's shaking the nations literally. So that, not, so that the world actually will be ready for the coming of Christ. He wants to shake it up a little bit and, and get people's attention that they need a higher power invading their life. We participate with God by engaging with the realms of government on the earth. In other words, he's put us here to release his kingdom in the earth. Some would say uh, that we should not engage with government because we're not of this world, we're of other kingdoms. But if we do not have a plan to engage with culture and society, it will simply turn around and rule us. So either we rule it or it's going to rule us. You know, Daniel was set in as an assistant to the king, as an advisor, as a ruler. Joseph was set in as the second most powerful in the nation of Egypt. And that really gets interesting when you study that. Because here he is, it's not even, it's not even a nation that God is calling his own, right? It's like, it's a foreign nation, but yet... His man gets put in, in, in uh, the second most powerful position in that nation. Moses was raised up in Pharaoh's house. We could say the president's house. And he was prepared as a leader. He was governed and he was groomed and trained as a ruler to rule the nation. So the seven culture shaping areas of influence over Uh, Each society, media, government, education, economy, family, religion, and celebration, which is the arts and entertainment, all are keys to taking a nation for the kingdom of God. I have a wonderful friend. He he spoke here, Hanny, um, uh, a prophet from North Carolina. The Lord put upon his heart the Czech Republic 
And he told me, he says, I want to transform that nation because they were under communist rule for so long that they, their identity was basically stripped away. So he says, after they were set free from the communism and turned back into the Czech Republic, he said, the, it's almost like they're all standing around waiting for somebody to pick up leadership and tell them what to do. And he says, he realized it's because they lost their identity in their own culture, in their own nation. So they're kind of still waiting, waiting. And so he said, I will never win the nation <clears throat> by starting at the bottom and trying to get everybody saved going up to the president. He goes, let's just start with the president and like let it trickle down, right? That's the way to turn a nation. That's the way God does it. He, he gets a leader in the right place and the whole nation takes notice. God is, is really calling the church's attention to these areas and helping each individual determine his or her specific assignment in the mission. Many Christians, as I said, are just beginning to grasp that God's favor is for us to succeed already upon us. It's a here already and it's upon us and it's part of his end time strategy to establish Jesus as the ruler of the nations before his return. The church is coming to an understanding that this favors a divinely strategic and corresponds to the place of each person's ministry assignment. And many have spiritual poverty or have a spiritual poverty vision or poor eschatology at best, two factors that have robbed us of our blessing and caused us to fail to reclaim cultural influences for Christ. Many I know we're taught as, you know, early on in the church or, or early on in America that just leave the government alone. You don't, don't touch that. I mean, I was kind of raised that way myself. You know, so no matter what ho happens over the next few months, everyone remain calm, right? This is not the end, only the end of the world as we know it. Because <laughs> why? The best is yet to come. We have to believe it. We have to see that. Jesus is very interested in us transforming this nation and our society to a godly, righteous culture. Unfortunately, when some people hear the phrase, the end of the world, they envision cataclysmic scenarios that involve apocalyptic doom and global destruction. For many years, that's the way the book of Revelations was taught. They tend to see all chaos and crisis through this negative lens and sadly it destroys your hope for a bright future but that's not the kind of message that God has prepared for us I believe that God always gives warnings that leads up to something okay he first gives many opportunities for awakening and repentance before he brings correction on any nation or situation and so in essence, there is a great awakening. If before there is a great awakening, he will send a rude awakening or a shaking upon a nation. That's what's happening today. He sent us a rude awakening. He's, he's shaking our nation. He says, American church, really, it's a, it's a message to us. What do you want? What are you willing to stand up for? You know, what are you willing to declare over your nation? America has been given a picture of what will, we will become if we lie down and let the enemy run over us. And believe me, the enemy has no respect for you. <laughs> if you lay down your weapons and do not fight to be an overcomer, he's going to run over you. He will not back off or feel sorry for you. Jesus has already become the overcomer. He's given us the victory. So let's just enforce his rule upon the earth, okay? Let's enforce the victory of Christ over our nation. And throughout all of history, cultural shaping, revival, and reformation of societies have come right up to the point of an earth-shattering crisis. I believe the magnitude of crisis that is given is, is in direct proportion to the vastness of the glory, transformation, and revival that is to come. 
in every case. I believe there's an equal proportion. Like if you're shaken hard, if this nation is really rattled and shaken, it's because there's some really strong glory and victory and godly things that want to be released. So then we can all say, let it be so, right? Let's just say that right now. Let it be so. Let the kingdom of God come to America. I've done that as, I, uh, as a pastor every once in a while. I'm called to a different situation, even in businesses. I remember one girl asked me to come visit her boss for her because some things were not right. And so that day that I showed up, I st- as I stepped over the threshold, I says, the kingdom of God has come to this place. <laughs> you know what? She got her bonus. She got her raise. She, you know, things turned around for her. Many prophets has been calling this decade of the 20s the, the birth of a new era. It's true. So we know for the new to unfold, the old must end, right? We must prophetically discern the movement of God and the advancement of his unshakable kingdom during the shaking and crisis we are going through. And as I mentioned before, David, uh, actually King David, encountered a similar situation in his lifetime. In Psalm 2, it's one of my favorite ones lately because it well, it just speaks to our situation. In Psalm 2, David, King David prophesied over the kings of the earth uh, that were in fierce opposition against the leadership of Jesus. Jesus, who is the ultimate son of David, right? Who's going to inherit all the nations. David found a lot of leaders that were in conflict or in opposition to them. This conflict reaches its pinnacle in the end times. We're going to see even more of it. But as, if you study Psalm 2, it has four parts. I want to quickly give those to you. The king's, the number one is the king's fierce opposition to Jesus' leadership. What, it, it was, he speaks about the angry rebellion that was going on. Number two is the father's response, a message to the rebellious kings. This is all in Psalm 2. So the father gives his response to the, the rebellious kings, in verses 4 to 6. And then number 3, Jesus' response to the Father's message. Jesus jumps in on this in, with an intercession, as an intercessor, in verses 7 and 9. And then number 4, David warned the leaders of the nation to obey the Lord. It's a wonderful outline, very small outline of Psalm 2. Both proclamation and prayer prepare the way of the Lord. So we need to speak, we need to pray to prepare the way of the Lord over our nation. Let's not give up, let's not give in. We are in a decade of pay and it's a decade to pray and proclaim. We release on earth the things of heaven. So let's, let me just quickly give you these four parts of Psalm 2 because this applies to us today. Part one is the king's fierce opposition to Jesus' leadership. David prophesied that the nations would rise up in anger against Jesus' leadership, especially his standards of morality and his purpose related to Jesus and Jerusalem. Let me read it for you, 1 through 3, Psalm 2, verses 1 through 3. Why do the nations rage? And the peoples plot a vain thing. The people, the kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed saying, let us break their bonds in pieces and cast away their cords from us. Against the Lord and against Christ, the kings, the rulers and the people will specifically plot against the Lord or the father in this case and his anointed one, Jesus, to cast off God's ways to stand against his decree that Jesus, as the son of David, will rule over the nations from Jerusalem. To break their bonds and cast away their cords means this, that they plan against God, that the plan against God will be focused on casting away his word. Remember where the word word tells us that in the last days, there's going to be a shortage of the words because people, it's going to be taken away and you're going to have to know it in your heart. 
It's not going to be looked upon with favor. It's not going to be a free thing for everyone to just grab a hold of. But these people will see God's work in a negative light as if there were bonds that enslaved them or cords that bind them to God's morality and his ways. So their, their uh, rebellion is actually to cast off the bonds of righteousness because they do not want to submit to the Lord. Part two is the father's response. I'm going to quickly give you this, a message uh, uh, to the kings. This is from God. David makes known the father's message to the hostile kings of the earth. He will distress the rebellious leader with his judgments and will magnify Jesus' leadership as his king over all nations from Jerusalem. I always like to see the nation of Israel and what God did for them as like, I mean, America is like a microcosm of that, right? It's like a type and a shadow. So the father's response includes uh, it includes him laughing and mocking the kings, holding them in derision, speaking to them, distressing them, and declaring his victorious purposes in magnifying Jesus as king in Jerusalem. I love it. The Lord just sits and laughs because he knows he has the last say. Right? He's not intimidated. Verse 2, verses, uh, I mean, Psalm 2, verses 4 through 6. I'm going to read it for you. He who sits in the heaven shall laugh. The Lord shall hold them in derision. Then shall he speak to them in his wrath and distress them in his deep displeasure. Yet I have set my king on my holy mountain of Zion and Jerusalem. The Father's actions are made known to give boldness to his people and to encourage faith and instead of fear. So be full of faith. Go in victory. Just cast aside fear right now. God's people are not to draw back in any way from intimidation, in intimidation from before the kings of the earth. The Lord sits on his throne in sovereign power to his people. Um, I'm sorry, The Lord sits on his throne in sovereign power and laughs with confidence at the plans of the kings of the earth to stop his purposes and his people. I think one day soon we're going to see God laughing. He's already laughing at the purposes and plans that the the rebellious ones are setting. They're running ahead of the whole game, trying to put themselves on the seat, and they're going to get knocked off of the seat. Okay? Okay. He will hold them in contempt. (laughs) I like that. He's going to hold court and he goes, I find you in contempt. Boom. Hit the gavel. He's not going to tolerate their deeds, but he will begin manifesting his anger. He will not appease them in any way. He wants them to know about his anger towards them because he's not happy with them and their rebellion. Part three then is Jesus' response to the Father's message. Intercession. That's that's what Jesus' purpose was. David in verses uh, Psalm two, verses seven and nine. David here overhears a dialogue of the Trinity, in which the Father exhorts Jesus to pray for the nations as his inheritance. In Psalm two, verse seven, David records one of the most important statements about how Jesus will rule the nations. He will do this by making decrees that the Father gave him. See, we're little Jesuses, right? So we need to be decreeing things. But we have to know what he says. Here he says, I will declare the decree. The Lord has said to me, you are my son. Today I have begotten you. Ask of me, says the father, and I will give you, Jesus, the nations for your inheritance and the ends of the earth for your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron. So Lord, we're just asking tonight that you give us this nation Give the righteous people in this land, this nation, that we would break them with the rod of iron. Father, it's it's speaking of your authority, your power, your dominion decrees. Father, break this nation because you've given it to us as an inheritance. So here in verse 7 then, we see Jesus declaring the Father's decrees. We see Jesus, the great intercessor, praying for the full release 
of his promised dominion over the nations to be manifested openly. We want to see the nations submitted to Jesus openly. <clears throat> this gives us insight into how much the Father prioritizes the call to his people to partner with him in prayer. Luke 18, verse 7 says, Will not God bring about justice for his elect who cry to him day and night? Verse 8, He will bring about justice for them quickly. However, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? In Acts 10, God answers Cornelius' weak prayer, releasing a great breakthrough of the Spirit. See, sometimes all it takes is prayer to release a great breakthrough of the Spirit. There was a a certain man in Caesarea, this is in Acts 10, there was a certain man in Caesarea called Cornelius, a centurion, a devout man, the one who feared God, one who gave alms generously to the people and prayed to God always. He clearly saw in a vision an angel of God saying to him, Cornelius, your prayers and your alms have come up for a memorial before the Lord. You never know the smallest thing that you give to people, the smallest alm that you give, the smallest offering. You know, if it's done with the right heart, it means everything. It means more than a person who wrote a check in the wrong reason for a million dollars, okay? The two nickels could be worth more to the Lord than a million dollars given with wrong intentions. So partner, uh, part four David warns the leaders of these nations to obey God. It's, it's basically or else, right? This is Psalm 2, verses 10 through 12. I'm going to give it to you quickly. Now, therefore, be wise, O kings. Be instructed, you judges of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the son, lest he be angry, and you perish in the way when his wrath is kindled but a little. Blessed are those who put their trust in him. It's an admonishment to, in other words, turn your life around, turn your heart around, O king, before God has to deal with you. It's better for you to do it yourself. It's better for you to fall on the rock and be broken than the rock, fall on you and to be crushed into powder. Okay, it's I love that picture. <laughs> The plan against God is focused on casting away from uh, his word from society and culture, including all political and social institutions and away from culture itself. This all seems dark and dismal, but wait, the best is yet to come. Right now in our society, we are witnessing the spirit of Antichrist trying to overtake our land. These haters of God are people uh, who see God's word in a negative light as if it were bonds that enslave them and cords that bind them to his morality and his ways. So they're totally against you and I for that reason. They're not really haters of you. They hate God. They hate his word. They hate truth because why their deeds are dark. It is all written before the Lord returns. Sin will reach the highest heights in history. That's found in Daniel 8 and 1 Timothy 4. There is an unholy momentum building as many attack God's commands, seeking to remove all moral boundaries from the culture, including the sanctity of life, marriage, and sexuality. Daniel 8, though, verse 23, he said this, In the latter time of their kingdom, when the transgressors have reached their fullness, a king, in parentheses, Antichrist, shall arise. Who understands sinister schemes? Remember I told you last week that the reason the enemy tries so hard to switch times on us is because he attempts, it's his attempt to mess up the plans of God. So that if he can change the times, and especially appointed times, then he thinks he's going to get away with messing up God's plan. That's why Jesus is, um, you know, Mary and Joseph had to, run to Egypt because his life was being threatened. You know, the same with Moses. He, his life was threatened. And uh, it's, it's like the Antichrist spirit even then was trying to take them out. But I want to leave you with good news tonight. Say amen. I'm glad. Thank you. Thank you, Jesus and, and Pastor David. 
Habakkuk 2 says the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord. Glory is not a thing. It's like a pair of shoes or a fine metal uh, or a fine meal, a lamp or a candle or even a house. Those particular things are physical items that could be carefully described with words that you would immediately have an accurate picture of in your head if, uh, if that's what's being talked about. We could play charades tonight and I could draw a picture of a shoe or take a photograph of a cottage or you could, uh, you could see it and know right away what it was, right? But glory isn't like that. How do you draw glory? They used to emanate it, you know, the artists a long time ago in, in the dark ages and all, they, they used to draw rings of like halos around the head because they were trying to express glory. I remember there's one statue of Moses that is carved. And uh, when I was in Europe many years ago, it was explained to me because they had horns on his head. We go like, oh, they're like, wow, what's that? And they described it as they were trying to show that he had glory. I don't know if that's true, but that was what the guy said, the tour leader. But I, it sounded like it was right, because I'm thinking there would be no reason why Moses would have horns on his head, you know. But they said, well, he was trying to uh, just give his interpretation of, of the glory of the Lord radiating from his face. Sounds good. So... But no single drawing, painting, or photograph, or verbal description could ever capture glory. Glory isn't so much as a, a thing as it is a, as a description of a thing. God isn't, glory isn't part of God. It's all that God is. Every aspect of who God is and every part of what God does is glorious. But even that's not enough of a description. Not only is he glorious in every way, but his very glory is glorious. Even his glory is glorious. <clears throat> First Timothy verse 16 says, He dwells, I love this one, in unapproachable light. That's a lot of glory. I used to think these lights up here were really, really intense, and they are. But we actually found a way to dial them back. And, and set the cameras where the cameras open up. And then I'm not under such, you know, like scrutiny up here with this, all this glory. But in everything that he has and in everything that he does, God's glory is greater than any human description. Every attribute and action of God is stunningly beautiful in every way. That's why we like to sing the way we do. It's always about looking at the face of the Lord, seeing, gazing upon the beauty of who he is. If we're fascinated with Jesus, our hearts become soft and our hearts become uh, yeah, mushy. Mushy is a term. That's a good one. <clears throat> Tenderize. Where he tenderizes our heart. And we, it's so easy to give in to the Lord, right? When you know you're loved. When you know he tenderizes your heart. He touches your heart. I love what Mike Bickle used to say. It takes God to reveal God to the human heart. So every characteristic of God and every accomplishment from his hand is totally perfect. This is what we mean when we talk about the, the God's glory. It's the stunning reality of this universe, uh, of this universe is that there exists one who is the greatest the most beautiful and the most perfect in every way. God is glorious, gloriously beautiful, gloriously perfect. There is none like him. He has no rivals. I love to just sing, and we could sing this right now, right? No valid comparisons can be made to him. There's no, there's no competitors of God, you know? You think... Who's opposite of, uh, of God? People say, the devil. No, he's not. He's not even, he's not even in that category. <clears throat> no rivals, no valid comparisons can be made to him. He is the great other. He's in a category all by himself. 
He's in a category uh, beyond our ability to estimate or understand fully or even describe. We can't even describe his glory. We just talk about his glory. We sing about his glory. But we, it's impossible to even to sing about the fullness of his glory. Every part of God is glorious in every way possible. There's nothing more to be said. He's glorious, totally glorious. And because God is glorious in every possible way, he stands alone in this vast universe as the only one who is worthy of worship, surrender, and love of every human heart. You know, he, he, he actually is deserving of the love of the human heart. Only God's glory can satisfy the hunger in our hearts. <clears throat> the human spirit was designed in God's likeness. Therefore, humans are eternal. They have a God-shaped vacuum, we've often been told, in their heart that nothing else can satisfy but God alone. So we have nothing to fear, folks. We have nothing to fear. The book of Revelation is called the Revelation of Jesus because first it reveals the, the majesty of his heart and the leadership of his plan to transition the earth in the age to come. But it's to transition every nation to bowing and to his rulership and his authority. We're not going to have to live like this forever with COVID and weird leaders trying to unseat other leaders. Secondly, it's a book about events that will occur in his end time plan to purify the church, bring in the harvest, replace all evil governments and drive Satan totally off the planet. God's purpose in Revelation is first to reveal the man behind the plan, the glorious man behind the plan. He is much better than any leader on planet earth today. Amen. Let's stand. I'm gonna, we're going to pray. See, cultivating a love for God has the greatest impact on God's heart and our heart alone. Cult Let me say that again. Cultivating a love for God has a great impact on God's heart, but it also impacts our own heart. Anyone who loves Jesus will love others even much more. Our greatest, this is our greatest calling, is to love God first and to love others second. And while some people only seek God's will for their own life focus on knowing what they are supposed to do instead of sometimes what they're supposed to become. We need to focus on what we are supposed to become. And when, when some speak of wanting the greatest calling, they refer to the size of their ministry instead of the size of their heart. The greatest grace we can receive tonight is the anointing to feel God's love and to express it towards others. We express it to him and we express it to others. It brings the greatest freedom and has the greatest reward of all eternity. To love God first and to love others. So Father, tonight we take the symbols as Jesus told us to take the bread and the wine. Father, we take the bread that represents your broken body. And Father, we thank you for Jesus. Jesus, we thank you for laying down your life voluntarily that we would be healed and, and, and that our bodies would be restored, our minds would be restored. Father, that we would be transferred into the likeness of you, that you would restore us back to our, your, our original glory in the garden with you. We were designed to live with you. We were designed to partner with you. You designed us to contain your glory, to contain your breath, become living creatures, ruling and reigning over this earth, letting your kingdom flourish here. Father, it was your plan. And we thank you, Jesus, for this broken body that you've laid down willingly. Father, that we could be restored back to original, that you've created a brand new race, that you've taken our, our uh, failures and washed them away under the blood of Jesus. 
Thank you, Jesus, for your broken body. Go ahead and partake. Father, we thank you for the blood of Jesus, the most powerful thing on earth, the most powerful thing in heaven. This is a testimony of what he did, of his genuine love for us. Father, it, it melts our heart tonight to stand before you in the heavenly realm, looking and gazing upon the throne, knowing the Lamb, the perfect Lamb sacrificed Himself so that we could be, that our very DNA could be changed, that we could be restored for all of eternity to be in partnership with You. We become the bride. Jesus receives us. And together we live in all of eternity in righteousness in holiness, in right standing before you, in a love relationship. We don't have to work harder to gain access to you. We just have to love. We love you. We love our neighbors. We love those around us. We love those in this building. Father, I ask that tonight you would give us a revelation of your love, that every human heart in this building would leave here with a better understanding of the love of God. That is your desire, Jesus, to pull all the nations to you because you love them. You don't condemn them. You love them. Your love is deep. It goes deeper than anything we can imagine. So, Father, we just ask that you would give us a revelation, again, a fresh one, of how deep, your love is for us as we partake of the blood of Jesus as we do this symbolically of what was done in eternal in the eternal realm for us go ahead and partake I'm just going to invite Everyone down to the front, if, you, if you'd like prayer tonight, just a, a, I'm just going to make it quick, but I'd like to just like release something the Lord is, is like we're doing right now. He's releasing hope. He's releasing encouragement. He's releasing a, a deeper impartation of himself. It's not something I can give you. It's something Jesus is going to give you. If you would just like prayer or just come and stand um, right in front of the stage and I'm going to come down. We'll just put on that worship music and just quietly and we're going to um, just enter into the place of heaven. Let heaven touch earth. Let's just keep focus on that. Like, let's see heaven touching earth. We're standing on earth, but Jesus, we need you to uh, the heavenly realm to be imparted right now. Father, we need hope. We need encouragement. We need your uh, promises in our life revealed. We need the power and the manifestation of who you are to be revealed to us in a fresh new way. The Jesus of revelation, the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the last, the, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. Jesus, we worship you. Jesus. Father, tonight we ask for a strengthening on the inside. We ask for a spirit of might to come and strengthen the inner man. We ask that we would stand unmoved, unshaken by the power of your love, your grace, your mercy. Do something on the inside of us tonight, God. Cause us to get so bold. Bold in our faith. Bold in your spirit. 
that we will not be moved and we will not be shaken by what we hear and what we see, but we will stand in confidence in knowing what you're doing and how you're moving and what you're saying, that you're revealing yourself in this hour. Cause our eyes to see it. Open our ears to hear your voice and no other voice. That we will partner with you in this moment in time. That we will partner with what you're doing and what you're saying. And we will not waver, but we will stand in the power of your might. So strengthen us tonight, God. Strengthen us with the power of your might in the inner man. We thank you, Father, that you've caused us to be overcomers. And you said that those that overcome will become a pillar in the temple of God. And tonight we decree and declare that we are overcomers. There is nothing that we cannot fight and stand against. You have given us everything we need in the power of your Holy Spirit. So Holy Spirit, come and move in us. Minister to us tonight. Strengthen our hearts where our hearts been weary. Strengthen our mind where our minds been in confusion. Strengthen our body where we felt fatigued and weary. And strengthen us in every addiction and every problem that we are facing that's attacking us. That you have made us overcomers. And you've given us everything we need to get the job done. We thank you for that tonight. We thank you for your goodness and your mercy and your grace that's upon us, that touches us, that causes us to overcome. We thank you, Father. Right now, we thank you, Father. We thank you for your blessing. We thank you for your mercy. We thank you right now. Move, move on us right here, right now, in this place of your presence right now. Cause the increase to come right now. Touch, touch and heal, touch, restore. Everything that we're fighting against tonight, give us power, give us strength to overcome. Thank you, Father. We thank you for your goodness right now. We thank you for the power of your Holy Spirit right now. That you have not left us, but you walk with us. Thank you, Father. We are victorious in your name. We are victorious in your name, Jesus. The name that's above every name. The power that's above every name, Jesus. 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 More, Lord. More, Lord. More. More. Let the increase come. Let the increase of your spirit come. Cause us to be set ablaze for you tonight, God. Cause us to be set ablaze and burn out anything that's not of you, God. Just burn it out of us tonight. Thank you, Father. Touch us with your glory. Touch us with your power. For your great name's sake, for your glory, fill your vessel. Let the fire of the Lord come upon this young man tonight. Break in with your power. More, Lord. Cause the increase to come in his inner man. The Lord says, I'm strengthening you tonight. I've given you power to overcome many things. But the Lord says, watch and see what I'm going to do. Just watch and see what I'm going to do with you. My hand is upon you, and I say I will never let you go. And I will fill my words within your mouth, and you will hear my voice. And I'm even giving you dreams and visions and revealing myself. For now is the time for the doors of encounter are open. Get ready. Get ready to see what you've never seen before and to hear the sounds of heaven you'll hear the songs of heaven the Lord says he's put a worshiping anointing in you to worship and when you worship breakthrough atmospheres change Jesus Jesus we love you more Lord touch tonight 
touch, strengthen, more fire. More fire, Lord. More fire. Set us ablaze tonight, God. Set our prayer life on fire, God, where the enemy tries to shut us down, cause intercession to come out of us like a fire, like a mighty rushing wind. Let it come, Lord. Let it come out of her innermost being. Let it flow like a river. More, Lord. Let it come. More. Let the increase come. Let the increase come. A fresh flow, a fresh wind. Fresh wind, fresh fire. Encounters <laughs> in the night. Angelic activity in his room at night. Let him see it. Let him hear what you're saying. Let him hear what you're doing. The Lord says, I'm going to reveal to you what I'm, how I'm moving and what I'm doing. Awaken God. Awaken places in her that she didn't even know needed awakening, God. Whoa, stir, stir the passion, stir the fire, stir up again, Lord, stir up again. Let the fire come, let the fire come, let the fire come. Whoa, whoa, more, Lord, more, Lord. More, Lord, set her ablaze for you. Set her ablaze for you. Set her on fire, God. Let a fire come out of her innermost being tonight, God. Set her ablaze for you. That she will run through the nations, even in Africa. She will run and she will declare your word. Whoa, even now, fire. Fire, she'll prophesy. Thank you, Father, for the fire of your spirit. Holy Spirit, come, touch, heal, heal right now, heal right now, every part, every part, every part that's broken, heal right now, every dysfunctional part, by your power, by your grace, Jesus, Jesus, we call upon your name, you are the victor, you are the one who sets us free, you are our freedom, Jesus, you are our freedom tonight. And I declare whom the sun sets free shall be free indeed in your mind, your thoughts, in your innermost being, in your heart, in your heart. Do a miracle in his heart right now, right now. The Lord says, I'm doing surgery on your heart and I'm stripping away all the scar tissue. I'm stripping it away because I'm going to set your heart ablaze for me. You're going to be so in love with me. You have time for nothing else, says the Lord. And every other distraction, I'm breaking it off of your life. Tonight, I'm doing something new. I'm doing something new. Oh, refreshing, let it come. Freedom, let it come. Freedom, let it come. Father, I thank you right now for your glory. I thank you for this man right now, God. Just touch him from the top of his head to the soles of his feet. Let your fire come. Oh, God, invade him right now with your glory. God, let him know what it is to taste of your glory, to encounter you face to face, that you would open up his eyes and let him see into the realms of your spirit. Open up his ears to hear your voice. And I just break every hindering thing that tries to trip him up. I break every addiction. I break every false lie that the enemy yes. lies to you. Yes. I break every lie that the yes. enemy tries to bring against you. Yes. And I declare over your mind, over your ears right now, a spirit of truth, a spirit of truth. I yes. break every lie right now. Yes. Every lying spirit, I break your power, your hold in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. And the Lord would say, I'm doing surgery on your heart tonight, son. And I'm cutting away all the scar tissue, all the heartache, all the bruising, all the mistreatment. Even as a child, you just wanted to love. But all you knew was rejection. 
And the Lord says, I'm breaking rejection down to the root off you tonight. I'm pulling it out by the root tonight, son, because I love you. And this was not my plan for you, but I have good plans for you, yes. says the Lord. Yes. You. That you'll bear fruit. Yes. Right now. Yes. Freedom. Yes. Freedom. Who the sun sets free is free indeed. cut you free. There's no holds. Yes. We cut every root. Yes. We declare liberty over yes. your heart and your mind. Fire. Yes. The fire of God. Yes. Release the fire of God. The passion of your heart, Jesus. The blazing heart of Jesus. Let it be in him. Yes. Change his heart tonight. Change his heart for your glory. Jesus. Jesus. Release your fire on us tonight. Release your fire on us tonight, Jesus. We want more of you. We want more of you. We're not satisfied. We want more. We were created for more. More of you, Jesus. More. More. More, 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 Lord. More, more, Lord, more. Healing of every bone in her body right now, every muscle right now, every disc. In the glory, there's no pain. In the glory, there's healing right now. In the fire, in the fire of his anointing, there's healing in your neck. There's healing in your neck right now. asking for more, more of you, more, Lord, more, more, oh, more, go deep, Lord, with your glory, go deep, go deep, more, Lord, more, do a deep work tonight, Lord, do a deep work, deep in her heart, God, deep in her heart. every false accusation for every rejection every false word that's been said to you I break that accusatory spirit I break it to say Would say the, the enemy's not going to steal any longer. For I'm restoring, redeeming back that which has been stolen, says the Lord. For it has grieved my heart. And I say, I am your protector. When you sing this song, this is the song I'm singing to you. I am your protector. I will bring you through, and you will have victory. You will do the dance of victory. For this was not my intention for you, says the Lord. But the enemy came against you. And I break his plan. I said, break it. And the Lord said, he will flee off the situation. He will flee. 
we just command him to take his hand off tonight. Now, 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 now. His assignment is broken. Now, now. Let the healing begin. Let it flow in like oil. Over that betrayal, let it come like oil into every wounded part right now. Let it flow in. For he comes and he pours in the oil and he pours in the wine and he restores the broken places for he's a good God. He's a good father. And his heart, it breaks and weeps for you for this was not his intention for you. And I say, let your joy be full. Let the wine of rejoicing be your portion. peace that passes all understanding. He's mantling you in peace tonight. He's mantling you in peace from the top of your head to the soles of your feet. No more worries. He's got everything under control. No more worries. He's a good father. Every situation he sees, he knows. And even some things that just seemed like they were finished. He says, stand and see what I'm going to do. It's not over until it's over. And even monies that have been taken from you, the Lord says, I will restore that which has got your name on it. I will see that it comes into your hand and I will fill your hands with more than you ever expected. It's going to flow like oil. It's going to flow like oil. I can feel it now. It's flowing like oil. It's flowing out of you like oil. Provision and blessing and a fresh anointing. Fresh fire. Dreams and visions. Prosperity. Breakthrough. ever known. Your eyes are going to see. Your ears are going to hear. Encounters in the night. Angelic activity in your house. Divine revelation from heaven. Now, touch your mind, Lord. Let her comprehend the things of the Spirit. Unlocking. The Lord says, I'm unlocking things tonight. I'm unlocking things tonight. I'm unlocking things tonight. And it's opening. It's opening. And you're going to see so clear, so clear. When before it almost seemed hazy, the Lord says, there's clarity now. There's clarity now. And the Lord says, you're going to know by a spirit of truth. When people tell you things, you're going to know if it's true or not. The Lord says, I'm giving you a spirit of truth by my Holy Spirit. And there's some people that have said some things to you, and it's not been the truth. So the Lord says, be careful. Ask me and listen with my ear. And let the Holy Spirit discern what they're saying. And let there be a quickening. Let there be an awakening on the inside of you of knowing the spirit of truth and knowing what is true and what is false. Let the glory come. Let the glory come. Let the glory fill her now. Fill her now fresh. Fresh fire. Fresh fire. Fresh fire. Let it come. Let it come. Sheba. Fire, let it come. You are 
the Comforter, Holy Spirit. You are the Comforter, Holy Spirit. Let this be the beginning of something new. Let this be the beginning, the awakening, the opening of new levels, of a new season, a new time. Shifting. Things are shifting. Changing. And the Lord says, enter into my joy. Be at peace. Be at rest. For truly, this is a fresh season for you. It's going to be glorious. Thank you, Father, for your healing. Thank you, Father. I don't care what they've said to you. I don't care what the x-rays show. My God is a God of miracles. In every nerve ending, every tissue, every muscle, every bone right now in the name of Jesus, I declare wholeness and healing right now. And what the enemy brought against you to try to rob you, we stand in agreement with you tonight and we say no. We overturn what he had planned and we release the plan of God. For the enemy tried to bring discouragement against you with your arm, in your job, in your situation, in your finances. And the Lord says, no more, daughter. No more. Am I not your Lord? Am I not your provision? Am I not your maker? worshiper come forth, the key of David, that when he dances, things will break and shake over nations, over cities. Let him dance, let him shout, and let things begin to shift. In Jesus' mighty name, release your fire, release your fire, release your fire, release your fire. More, Lord, more, 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 more. Tonight, tonight, put fire on his feet, God. 